Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to see you all and welcome to the second of VETCT's 12 minute take home webinars. Um, it's lovely to see so many of you return for a second week. Um, a lot of you are also joining um, for the first time, so it's good to see all of you as well. Um, just as a reminder, uh, VETCT recently launched our new app and teleconsulting service. Um, we'd love for you to all give it a go and give it a try. So through the app, uh, Vets get instant access to a team of friendly specialists offering support and advice on those tricky cases. You can choose to communicate with the team of specialists via instant callback, text chat, book an appointment at a time that suits you or ask for a written report. While anyone in the UK will also get the added benefit of real-time CPD on every case. To try this, please um, download the app from the App Store or Google Play. And if you scan the QR code on the screen now, um, it will also take you straight to the app to make life easy. This is beneficial for both vets in clinic and locums uh, alike. Um, and I'll be happy to discuss more with you. If you've got any questions, you can go to our website or contact me direct at david.moffat at vet-ct.com. You can see my name on screen, hopefully or uh, easier sales at bet-ct.com for more info. Now, on to today's 12 minute webinar. As a reminder, the session itself is being recorded and there will be an opportunity to ask a few questions at the end. So please do add any questions into the Q&A area of the webinar. Uh, we will answer as many as we can in the time and follow up with any others we can't get through afterwards. So um, to get us started, I'd like to introduce you to Marianne Matas, um, one of our very own friendly specialists. She's going to be discussing ocular ultrasound. So it's over to you, Marianne. Hi, hello. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. OK, so let's start. So we'll go through how to perform an ocular ultrasound. This is something that when we get some advice, um, uh, advice cases from you, we think some in some cases will be beneficial. So we thought it was uh, a useful tool to have for you uh, on how uh, we perform or how we recommend that you perform ocular ultrasound. So of course, we'll go through what we need. Um, how we position the patient, how we position the probe, and then we'll see how the eye is normal, how uh, an eye is seen ultrasonographically, and then we'll see a few case, uh, a case examples. So of course you're gonna need an ocular ultrasound. Ideally you need a linear probe that is uh, more than 10 megahertz a linear probe, and that will be uh, quite helpful and you'll have a very nice ima image if you have that, and then topical anesthesia, and of course a well-behaved patient. So the patient uh, will be either sitting or lying on its side uh, on the table, and you can uh, either choose to do a transcorneal approach or a transpalpebral approach. We normally prefer the transcorneal uh, approach um, with the use of a proximetracaine, so a, a, the a corneal anesthetic or ocular surface anesthetic to make sure we don't harm the patient and the patient tolerates um, the ultrasound well. Um, and then we will uh, use our non-dominant and hands to open the eyelid. So someone will need to hold the head still of the patient. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll do very slow scan movements uh, vertically from medial to lateral and horizontally from uh, ventral to dorsal. And they will be very, very slow uh, movements. And we can do also some uh, oblique um, views and that I'll show you in a second. So uh, as a model of an example, we used a, uh, a globe, um, uh, a demonstration globe to see how we place the probe. We try not to put a lot of pressure on the eye. And these are would be the vertical and the horizontal and then some examples of the obliques that we can do. We can also, um, if you don't have a linear probe, you can try to um, use a standoff, like a very a handmade <laughs> standoff with a with a glove uh, filled with um, uh, with water, with tap water, and that will increase your focus length. In case you don't have a linear probe, you might be able to see something with uh, with this type of um, uh, a standoff. And then we have also the temporal approach, uh, and that uh, it's an alternative when we don't want to manipulate the globe. It will be far away from the eye. We won't put any pressure on the globe. So if the eye is fragile, it might be a good alternative to approach uh, the ultrasound via it uh, this way. 
So how do we see a normal eye ultrasonography? So remember the globe is filled with fluid, fluid is seen dark, uh, so anechoic on ultrasound, and we will see only a few lines. So we will see, um, uh, so we'll see the, the chamber, the anterior chamber, then we'll see the lens, and then we'll see the features, right? And then these lines that we are seeing uh, is the cornea that is slightly flattened with a probe. You need to avoid that as much as possible. That might mean that you're putting a bit too much pressure there. The anterior lens cap the posterior lens capsule, and then the posterior wall. So let's see a few examples since we've seen how a normal eye is. Uh, so this is Tyson, he's a golden retriever, eight years old, male natured, and he came because he was really lethargic and he was really sore around that area. And we could clearly see that there was an abnormal right eye. We could see a lot of corneal edema and that avoid us or um, uh, did not let us see inside the eye. There was a lot of chemosis, edema of the conjunctiva, like you can see in the image, and there was a bit of mild serous discharge. So um, because we cannot see inside the eye, an ocular ultrasound is indicated. And let's go through what the changes that we can see. So you can see the cornea is gonna be just touching the probe. We have this iris, which is bombe. So you can see there's fluid underneath and there's probably an attachment there. There's fibrin that I'll show you in a second how we could see that a bit later on. And then how this iris is so thickened that is completely attached to the anterior lens capsule. Then we have the lens, which looks pretty unremarkable, but then the posterior wall, you can see how thickened it is. This is not normal, so therefore there's some sort of infiltrative um, lesion that is causing all these changes. Unfortunately, the owner did um, this, I needed a nucleation, um, but the owner refused and we lost follow-up. This is the picture where you might be able to see just around here, there's a fibrin clot, a fibrin clot, and you can kind of see it up there in the anterior chamber. Okay, the, another case is Conan. Conan is a three-year-old uh, male nature, and, uh, and he also came because he was slightly lethargic and he had an abnormal right eye. You can see there's mild corneal edema, there was meiosis and a lot of flare, which means that there's intraocular inflammation, and there was a lot of peri uh, some periocular swelling with mild serous discharge. Since we could not see inside the eye, the ocular ultrasound was indicated. And um, things that are in interesting to see in this case is the cornea is just over here. This is the iris, yeah, which is probably out by the dorsal part, so we can see iris all over. We don't see the pupil there. We see the lens. And then in the back, in the vitreous chamber, which should be completely anechoic, we see that there's quite a lot of cellularity. And in different planes, we could see this, lean, this line, hyperechoic line, which ended up being a foreign body after we recommended the nucleation of, of the patient, of the eye of the patient, of course. This is Toby. Toby is another patient that came because uh, the owners noticed that the eye had changed in color. And what you can see here is um, a section, an oblique section that I'm showing you. And you can see how in the anterior chamber, there's a, a thickening and a hyperechoic, echoic, hyperechoic lesion occupying the anterior chamber, which we could actually see it in the image. But um, the objective of this ultrasound was to make sure the posterior chamber was clean um, uh, and there's that the, the lesion was only located in the anterior chamber, which we could see. Something that I wanted to mention is that, as you can see, this patient had a cataract and um, we see many reports where the, uh, we define cataracts or diagnose cataracts on ultrasound, and that's not something we should rely on. As you can see here, there's a mild lens change, but actually it's not as severe as clinically, so you cannot rely on ultrasound to diagnose cataracts. Then another condition that you might uh, find useful is the um, uh, to use the ultrasound in your patients is to identify a lens luxation. In this case, Millie had the posterior lens luxation apart from some uh, uveitis. And this is the image in your right hand side that you can see how the iris leaflets are slightly gone backwards because they've lost the support of the lens and how the lens is in the back of the eye just uh, sitting over there. Another example, if there's a lot of corneal edema, you can use it to identify anterior lens luxation. And um, that's how you would see, you would see there's no lens in the middle and the lens is completely in the front part. This was Lily with a blunt trauma and we can see a deep anterior chamber. Uh, and the subluxation of the lens and some visual changes as well. 
And the next one was also a trauma and a cataract with some retinal detachments that you can see on the posterior chamber, uh, sorry, on the posterior segment and some Iris bombe um, over there. And then uh, a patient with a cataract, which, where we normally do ultrasound to make sure the posterior segment is healthy. And you can see how the cataract is obvious in, ultra, in this ultrasound, but is not something you should rely on. But this is one of the common reasons why we normally, uh, in, ophthalmology, in ophthalmology, we do ultrasonography of the eyes. Another typical example is a retinal detachment, like the seagull image that you probably have heard before. And this is this image of where the retina detaches and forms the this V-shape or seagull um, retinal detachment. So we've seen what we use, how we do it, how we see it normally, and we've seen some examples that hopefully will help you on your day-to-day -day practice. Thank you, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Okay, Kate Murphy asked, how long do you leave the proximate eye kind to work before you start? That's a great question. And um, we normally recommend 30 seconds. So it's really fast. Um, and in some dogs that we might feel that they are a bit responsive, but if we start, I might repeat it twice and, and give it a bit of um, at least 30 seconds. It's really fast, but we need to wait those. And sometimes we don't. Um, so there's another question. Do you normally apply ultrasound gel directly onto the cornea? Yes. So in the UK, you have uh, KY, which is a sterile sachets of gel um, that become sterile, and those were great. They're a bit too liquidy, but if you are worried if um, that the patient might have an infection or you are worried to use the normal regular ultrasound, then those are good. Uh, those um, sachets are quite helpful in the UK. I have not found them elsewhere, though. Super. I don't see any ans any more questions. Oh, there would a sterile aquasonic US. I, I guess, uh, Rafael, you mean that normal gel like we use on ultrasound for abdominal ultrasound, that would be perfect. You just need to make sure it's it's clean. You know, sometimes these waters are not that clean if we use them for other uh, purposes, but as long as the gel is clean and you change it regularly, I'm sure it's not a problem. I meant sterile sachets. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Rafa was meaning the sterile sachets that work really well. They are just a bit too fluidy and sometimes they, they, you, you need to use a lot to stay on the ocular surface, but you, you are very welcome to use them uh, if they work for you, absolutely. Let's see if there's any other questions. I think we're done. Uh, so someone, uh, Sheila is asking, uh, sorry if I don't pronounce that well, if the recording will be on the Vet City website, I'm, I'm sure David will, will answer that one. Hi, thanks. Uh, thanks, Marianne. And thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending. In quick answer to the question on the recording, we can we will um, we can get you a copy out. So if you drop us an email, if you want that, um, if you drop it through to sales at bet-ct.com or to me direct, it's david.moffat at bet-ct.com. I can we can make sure you get the recording. I think Tim will be sending this out to everyone anyway. Um, thanks, Marianne, for that, and thank you for thank you. sticking to the time. It was uh, uh, completely perfect, 12 minutes exactly, so thank <laughs> you very much for that. Thank um, you. We, and thanks, everyone, for attending. We hope you found it interesting and informative. Um, please do keep an eye out for any future sessions. Our next one is running slightly later next week at 1 o'clock uh, GMT, same day, Wednesday. And this is on localising the cause of respiratory distress with Dr. Lisa Smart. So please do register for that if you've not already done so. And finally, don't get, forget to download the app and, uh, and come back to us if you've got any questions. We look forward to seeing you all next time. Thank you.